those that best. Well, not much to say after these two have said that, but like she said, um, be dressed appropriately. Um, to me, that doesn't mean you have to wear a suit. It just means you have to come as if you expected to come into a courtroom, not like you were going to the beach. Um, I understand everybody can afford to wear a suit or can't. Uh, they'll have those types of clothes. My first thing is that you showed up. Um, I don't harp on that you brought your child to court. I know we're talking to young people, but young people have kids too. Uh, mothers have to bring children to court. So my, I'm not concerned that you can bring your child to court. We're not going to kick you out of the court because you had to bring a baby. Um, but be, uh, hold your head up when the judge is talking to you. Make sure that you respond if the judge asks you a question. Um, and I do juvenile court. And so a lot of times you have juveniles, which are children. Um, they just call children juveniles who come to court and they are charged with doing certain things that are just misbehavior. When I was growing up, you probably would have just gotten a spanking at home or you would have gotten sent to end school suspension or suspended for a few days, but now they charge you as being a juvenile delinquent. You have to come to court and your parents have to come to court with you and you ask a young man after his attorney says something, do you want to, what do you have to say about this? And then they talk like a mouse. So if the judge asks you to say something, make sure you speak up and say it. Again, come to court. Normally we ask in certain cases if the person was polite and cooperative with the officer. Because if you're polite and cooperative with the officer, that means that he or she is more than likely going to say good things about you which will improve what happens in your case. And I had that happen in High Point on Friday. This gentleman uh, had hung out with the wrong crowd. Like she said, was in a car. There was a gun found in the car. Um, and they had some marijuana as well. So he got a chance to do a first offender program. The only issue was he couldn't afford to pay the fee. He had done everything else. He had done the classes, had done forfeited the, the BB gun, which it was, and, and my first thing to him was, you, do you watch the news? Do you hear what happens to people that look like you who, are, who have guns in their possession? Most people don't think twice before they react. Um, and so do you want to be in a body bag? And I think it registered with him. But because the officer was there, and because the representative from the program was there, who said that he, he was a great participant, he didn't give me any problems when I engaged with him. Um, and the only issue was that he didn't have the money to pay the fee. And as a judge and as somebody who has the ability to help people, um, hearing input from those people and his attorney standing beside him and saying that he was cooperative, you know, showed up when he asked him to be where he was supposed to be. While the DA couldn't dismiss his case, I dismissed him because he had done everything else that he was supposed to do, and as a person of color, I realize that if he has this on his record, uh, then that prohibits, that there are consequences that come as a result of what I might do as a judge. If I give him a conviction and just give him court costs and waive them, he's still going to be convicted of a crime. Uh, but as a judge, you have the power, when used appropriately, to help people and do justice, and justice doesn't always mean that you send somebody to jail, that you give them another bill which is court costs and fees, it is that you at least help them see the path that they were on and try to change it by showing them mercy. And so if you come to the court, I hate to say worthy of mercy, everybody is worthy of mercy, but if you come to court you show respect and you've shown respect along the way, I think it gives you a better outcome. Um, I will say that over half of your district court bench in Guilford County is African American. So we all have the perspective as we see the people sitting in the audience that look like us. We understand how that happens. You have people that get charged with stealing things. I have one lady who, a uh, young lady, she had probably in her 20s, she had some kids with that sunglass hat. Um, and the person essentially profiled her at, at Four Seasons Mall and followed her around the store and assumed that she stole some Gucci shades. They brought the, the video in, the officer was honest on the stands, he just responded to where he was called. And because everybody doesn't have the same perspective, uh, the DA, when the, when the young lady said, well, when I reached in my 
shirt I put money in my bra. Her argument as a DA who was not a person of color with that, that's just totally unreasonable. But when you have a bench of, of judges that look like you, growing up with a black mother and a grandmother and a aunt, that's like, that's totally reasonable that she puts the money in her bra. So, know that the people that wear the robe are standing in judgment of you. We probably have some of the same experiences that you've had. It's just you just have to come before us to get your issues resolved. And so, uh, hopefully the perception that we don't think that we sit up here and look down upon people, but I try to make sure people realize um, that I'm just like them. Uh, so, but to that point, I think uh, it all revolves around whether it's what you spoke about on the judge or Officer James, it all boils down to authority. Um, because you shouldn't just be like that with a police officer. This also speaks in the classrooms. Um, it speaks with your parents. It speaks with anybody who is in charge of you at that time. Um, I know for me, I'm a father, and uh, both of my kids, when they were in high school, they would come home and they would have issues with their teacher. I don't think he liked me, or he went off on me, or she said this, or she said that. And uh, they would really come home very upset at what that teacher said to them, or what that teacher did to them. And I think that it's important, as kids, that um, you understand that we're all human, right? And so when my, I think it was my daughter, and she's here today, uh, I sat her down and I had to ask her, I said, uh, do I love you? And she said, yes. I said, do I get mad at you sometimes? And she says, yes. Um, I'm like, but we move on from that, correct? And she said, yes. I'm like, look. I don't go a step further. Sometimes I don't like you. I told my daughter, like, I don't like you sometimes when you're doing bad or whatever. It don't mean that I don't love you, but you're in a bad space. But I said all that to say, if I love you and I don't like you at times, imagine how a teacher feels having to deal with you and a hundred more just like you. They're human as well. And none of y'all are related to your teachers. They don't have the obligation to love you. They have the obligation to teach you and to make sure that you're in the right place at the right time when you're in school. So I just feel like it's important that everybody look at themselves as human beings, uh, whether it's you're being quoted about a police officer or whether it's a teacher, because teachers are allowed to have bad days. Just like what the attorney said with the judge, our judges are temperamental. Um, I've been in court before and I've been told, you don't want that judge, let's reschedule you because of that judge's temperament. So it's important that in all situations know that adults have stuff going on too. And that I don't even know, like I've always said, I think teachers should be paid the most. They have to go to a lot of, do a lot of uh, schooling in college and they don't get paid a lot to deal with the stresses and to take care of our kids on a regular basis because teachers, let's be honest, they are sub-parents. They're the parents when you're at school. So I just feel like it's important that uh, we don't just talk about authority to the law and to the court and to the justice system, but we talk about that as well in schools because they all go together. You know, if you, if you'll see it as you grow up. The kids that get in trouble in school are going to be the ones that sit in front of this man. Like, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. Life continues. It starts here, it goes here, and, and it keeps on progressing. But you are still in some kind of social experiment through your entire life. And through your entire life, you have to be, my mom says, you got to answer to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to always be the case. So I just want you all to take that, not just from the law enforcement side, but also in your everyday life. Now, to go back to something that uh, Attorney Smith was talking about, and she had everybody in the car with their hands up in some way, shape, or form. I would like to ask Officer James, what do you speak to? Her tactics. Also, what do you look for when you walk up on a car, and, and what are some things that might trigger your spidey sense to, you know, react? Well, as far as speaking to the temperament of officers, I mean, obviously, uh, every person is different, and every police officer is different. Uh, my hope is that uh, every officer is not in fear of their life when they're dealing with someone on a vehicle stop or any other interaction. I would say that 
you do have to be alert, you know, because things can happen quickly. Uh, when you approach a vehicle, and I'll say especially at night, you don't know what's going on inside the car. You may stop somebody for an expired registration, and they could be a homicide suspect. Now, I know that's an extreme example, but occasionally things like that do happen. You can stop a person for a simple traffic violation, but they've actually been involved in something more serious. Um, what I'll say is that because, you know, there is a heightened sense of awareness, uh, what I would hope is that the person being stopped is cooperative, and I talked about cooperation uh, previously, but if they are cooperative and they're communicating with us and doing what we're asking them to do, then that's going to lower uh, our, our sense of, uh, of caution. You know, so if I stop somebody and I walk up to the car and they're like, what'd you stop me for? You know, then, okay, now we've already, we're already here, you know. And, uh, and so what, what we ask our officers to do to try to lower it, you know, the first thing, like if I get pulled over, and uh, and actually, when I'm not being a police officer, I'm a black man, so so keep that in mind. But the first thing I want to know is why I got stopped and who's stopping me. You know, so uh, when I was stopping cars, and quite frankly, I don't stop a lot of cars now because of my my place in organization. But uh, but I would say, hey, I'm Officer James. Uh, the reason why I stopped you is because you know I got you doing 52 and a 35. Could I see your license and registration? And I use this example one of the groups. Now, how does that sound compared to me just walking up to the car and say, let me see your license and registration? You know, if I've already told you, you know, who I am, why I stopped you, and then make the request, then hopefully that's going to set the tone for, uh, you know, cooperation between the person being stopped and the police officer. But I'll say that if, if the person... You know, is saying, "Well, I'm not going to get. I'm not going to give you my license registration. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that." Okay, now we're getting into a point where you're not being cooperative, and more than likely, that officer is probably his his or her uh, senses are heightened, and they're probably going to call for another car to come by as an assist. So I would say that you know we have a an obligation to try to de-escalate situations where there's tension, but I would say that as as a citizen too, they also have a an, a, a, uh, an opportunity. I would say. To, uh, to de-escalate the situation. But it's perfectly okay if the officer doesn't tell you why you were stopped or whatever the, the situation is to say, you know, can I ask you why I'm being stopped? Uh, but as a driver, you know, the driver does have an obligation to uh, surrender, essentially surrender your license or registration because driving is a, uh, is a privilege uh, by law. I mean, and that's the way it's actually defined in the in the general statutes, it's a privilege, so there is an obligation to give up the license registration. But uh, but we are looking for that cooperation because, like I said, if I go to somebody's car and they're they're doing everything, and nobody likes to be stopped. Let's just put that out there. Nobody wants to be stopped by the police. But if they're being cooperative, then that's gonna that's gonna lower my sense of caution, and I think the, the interaction is gonna, gonna go much better.